So, shall we start? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-aliyyil azim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina abil qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. Wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. La siya ma baqiyyat illahi fil aradin. Ajjala Allahu ta'ala farajahu al-sharif wa ja'alana min a'wanihi wa ansarih. اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحم I promise that every week, we, every session we would start with a hadith about learning and knowledge so in the first session we had a hadith from Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam about five things that those who want to become knowledgeable need. Today we have a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Part of this hadith is very famous, but maybe part of it is less heard. The whole hadith that I am quoting is from Al-Kafi, the late Shaykh Kulaini in Kafi, has Kitabu Fadl al Ilm, a section on the merit of knowledge. And in that section, there are different chapters. The fourth chapter is called Babu Thawab al Alim wal Muta'allim. This is the chapter on the reward for the learned and the learner. The first hadith. عن أبي عبد الله عليه السلام قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم إمام صادق عليه السلام says that the messenger of God said so this is a prophetic hadith that Imam Sadiq عليه السلام has mentioned the text of hadith is as follows من سلك طريقا يطلب فيه علما The one who embarks on a journey seeking knowledge Some people may leave home to go to a place of learning Some people may leave their town Some people may leave their country Some people may leave their continent There are different options but regardless as soon as a person embarks on a journey seeking knowledge salakallahu bihi tariqan ila jannah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would also put him on a journey on a road on a path on a route towards heaven I hope, inshallah, your efforts of coming on this journey for learning, although you are not physically moving, but because your mind and heart are moving towards knowledge, inshallah, would be included. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make them able to reach heaven this is the part that you have heard a lot the angels who are pure who are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they spread their wings for the seeker of knowledge. So they open, they spread, they open their wings for the seeker of knowledge. Rizambi. Uh, 
and this is out of pleasure either this out of pleasure means seeking knowledge out of pleasure they want to please Allah or the angels do this out of their pleasure both can be possibly correct in the uh, you know this situation that we are hearing about for sure nothing is done without pleasure when there is a seeker of knowledge and when there are angels and above all is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything is light everything is according to pleasure وَإِنَّهُ يَسْتَغْفِرُ لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ and truly for the seeker of knowledge whoever is in the sky and whoever is on the earth ask for forgiveness so the angels as we have in the Quran for example الذين يحملون العرش ومن حوله يسبحون بحمد ربهم ويستغفرون للذين آمنوا the Quran says that they ask forgiveness for the mu'mineen, for the believers. So here, for the believers who are seekers of knowledge, not only the angels seek forgiveness, but even whatever is on the earth, even animals would seek forgiveness. يستغفر طالب العلم من في السماء ومن في الأرض حتى الحوت في البحر even fish in the sea understands and appreciates in its malakuti condition the fact that someone is seeking knowledge Inshallah, gradually when we, you know, discuss uh, more about uh, Aqa'id, we will have better opportunity to explain that how everything, despite the way they look to us, the way they appear to us, which might not involve understanding or intelligence, but we will explain, inshallah, that the, everything has another face which can be seen from a Malakuti perspective and from that aspect they have understanding they have love they acknowledge good work that someone does and they show dissatisfaction when someone disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the world as it is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is intelligent and obedient and busy with glorification and praise for us we see some of the things with life some of them without life some of them with intelligence some of them without intelligence but there is another aspect of this world which is facing Allah and that is different in any case Everything in the sky, on the earth, would seek forgiveness for the seeker of knowledge. وَفَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِ الْقَمَرِ عَلَى سَائِرِ النُّجُومِ If you want to compare an alim with a worshipper hadith says the position of alim compared to worshipper is like the position of moon compared to other stars when the moon is complete not when it's crescent it's badr in the night of the 14th 
when the moon is complete it's called Badr crescent is Hilal so imagine moon in its complete form how shining it is how big it is compared to small little stars that sometimes you have difficulty even in finding them the same is the difference between Alim and Abid Abed is very important. We don't underestimate the position of Abed, someone who has devoted his life to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who doesn't disobey Allah at all, doesn't do any justice. He's doing good, but his knowledge, his understanding is limited. And also he doesn't have concern about guiding people. He's focused on his ibadah. So this is a good person, but compared to Alim, it's much lower. So Fadl al-Alim ala al-Abid ka Fadl al-Qamar ala Sa'ir al-Nujum Layla al-Badr. Wa inna al-Ulama warathat al-Anbiya. The Prophet says, the true scholars are the heirs. Of the prophets they have inherited the legacy the inheritance of the prophets what is the legacy of the prophets the prophets didn't leave behind golden or silver coins Dinar is golden coin, dirham is silver coin. So when we say they are the heirs of the prophets, it doesn't mean that they have inherited a piece of land or you know money or you know jewelries. No. They left behind knowledge. And ulama are those who have inherited the knowledge of the prophets. So whoever has obtained something from their heritage, something from this knowledge, has achieved a lot. This shows how great is Alim. There are many, many things about, of course, Ilm and Ulama and Muta'allameen. But I just wanted to share with you this Hadith, which is in Al-Kafi. Kitab Fadl al Ilm, Babu Thawab al Alim al Mutalim, according to my edition, is volume 1, page 34. It's the beginning of the Kaf al Sharif. Okay, now I am ready to, inshallah, discuss the questions. So if uh, one of the brothers lead us in this part, I will be great. Okay, so uh, we have, uh, inshallah, we can begin with question number one. Um, since we have a lot of questions, the first one has to do with a, with, a, with a typo. And I had asked you that I don't want to take time from the group to cover that. Um, instead, we can go to question number two. Yes. Um, and question number two, I'll read it out. Basically, uh, it's saying that on page 28 of chapter 3, there is the following line. They are free. God. They just have to take the first step, and Allah will help them. But, it, but their decision is not independent of Allah's generative will, between parentheses, to enable them. My question is about the first step. The first step seems to need energy and power in two ways. One way is the energy to move in any direction, and the other way is the desire or drive or determination to move in direction X while being tempted to go to direction Y, for example. I understand from the analogy of the father that gives money to his son to buy books that the money is like the energy to move in any direction, to buy something, whatever he wants, like taking a step in whatever direction. However, the desire
desire or drive or determination to move away from one direction to which one is attracted towards another direction which is better, like the example of the boy who must move away from the temptation of buying, for example, a cigarette and going towards the better path of buying a book, where does that energy come from? If we say it comes from God, then it is not free will. It becomes such that each person has the desire, drive, or determination to do something because God gave them that desire. But if we say it comes from the person, then we are saying that this person is independent from God, which poses a problem to the belief that God is controlling everything. So how do we solve this problem? And I propose, yes, uh, so is it acceptable to say, yes, the human being has been given a margin of independent consciousness by God, which is equally allotted to each human being, and ser then serves as a motor power for their free will to pull them away from temptation and strive towards sal salvation. This independent consciousness is like a higher, more sophisticated form of life that God has given each individual and can be taken away at any time. It is independent enough to have desire, drive, determination to make choices, but is absolutely dependent in its very being on an essence on God. Nevertheless, it is true that it has a margin of independence for which it is then held accountable. The fact that God has created such a being is a greater testimony to his power rather than a sign of his weakness. I'm sorry it's long, but uh, this was the question. Yes. Uh, thank you. I think uh, the brother or sister who has asked the question has also got the answer. So what is important is to believe that everything that we have comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for having a free action we need to choose and this needs some knowledge but this also needs some power and needs some desire the power comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe All you do with respect to power is just to use it or maybe you can also increase your power or reduce your power but the capital, the initial capital comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again with respect to desire, the initial comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has put in us desire for doing good things. But we have a combination of desires. Some of our desires by themselves are geared towards things which are good. Some of them are neutral. The desire for food, the desire for drink, for rest, for comfort. These are the desires which by themselves can be neutral. It's up to us how to use them. But for example, the desire for beauty, the desire for knowledge, the desire for acquaintance and friendship the desire for devotion to an unlimited and transcendent reality these are desires which by themselves are good so these desires again first come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but you can cultivate them or you can weaken them and the same is with knowledge so every human being to begin with has been given enough of power and knowledge and desire to start the journey. They are not given the same thing. It's not that everyone starts with the same package. But everyone has enough to move. And everyone is judged according to what he has been given. So those who have been given more, they are expected to act better. Those who have been given less, a little they do is appreciated and maybe a little they do can give them the same speed that if a person with a better condition has done much more. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives us all the 
initial uh, capital that we need whether it be desire or power of knowledge but also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the ability to add to this or to reduce it so the freedom is a test the freedom is a choice this choice needs a condition it's a framework and that is you should be given desire for acting power for acting and knowledge that platform is not totally created by us but our freedom is to act in that platform in that context in that condition that framework which have been given to us either completely independent from us or partly because of our own previous actions and choices what is important is that now in this context you are free to make the most out of it I hope uh, I explain enough but inshallah when we study Aqaid we will talk about this more because uh, some of these questions actually that brothers and sisters have asked uh, are questions related to Aqaid and in the book self-knowledge we have covered some Aqaid issues to prepare for um, self-development so very good questions alhamdulillah you have asked but uh, inshallah more explanation would come when we study Aqaid thank you so much then third question is uh, the reforming the way we think Assalamu alaikum. If our thoughts affect our heart, yet the purity of our heart affects the way we think, how do we break this circle? Uh, by the way, if some of these questions are, I'm just going to ask them and you, you know, if you want to say we answered it or answer it later, I'm just going to ask it as is. So uh, I'll continue. If our thoughts affect our heart, yet the purity of our heart affects the way we think. How do we break this circle? Likewise, if our actions affect our heart, if the quality of our actions is based on the purity of intention, the source of which is in the heart, where is the beginning of the process? Can awareness alone change anything? Does it mean that Allah has already placed a certain amount of light in everyone's heart, and it grows or decreases based on whether we utilize or reject it, or is there something else missing? Thank you. This is a, a kind of relation that we have between several things. Uh, like for example, uh, Iman and action, or Taqwa and action. If you have good action, it can uh, strengthen your Iman. If you have a stronger Iman, it would lead to having better actions. So, this is not a kind of vicious circle. This is a correlation so there are two things that go together hand in hand if one of them improves it can help the other one to improve if one of them is uh, weakened is badly affected it would also affect badly the other one and for sure awareness by itself is great awareness by itself can change this balance in the favor of the person's spiritual progress so although awareness may look to some people as something which is not very significant significant because we normally give more attention to the actions to something that you can physically see but awareness is actually very very important and it is through awareness that you may decide to do good things or you may decide to do better things so awareness is also very important and as it also says at the end and we said already in the previous question yes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given everyone a free package of light light of fitra at the beginning and this is something that by using it and utilizing it we can find our way towards greater light. The next question 
Question 4. Regarding benefits of self-knowledge. Amongst the spiritual benefits mentioned, the fifth one refers to gaining inner consciousness and, per and perpetual awareness, and therefore the ability to guard against negative inner processes and outer influence. It seems to be very close to the description of taqwa. What is the relation, sh what is the relation and difference between the two concepts? Uh, thank you. Uh, this is actually the force, the power, the energy that leads to taqwa. So taqwa means a condition that helps in refraining from doing bad things. So we wanted to see how this taqwa can come for a person. It seems that great part of taqwa, if not all of it, but at least a great part of taqwa, or you can say a great prerequisite for taqwa, the, uh, both can be actually said, is mm, awareness. When there is awareness, so one is alert and one is conscious about the ugliness of bad actions and the goodness of the good actions, then that person develops taqwa. Even for Isma, what is Isma? In Aqaid, inshallah, uh, uh, classes we will say that even Isma is very much related to knowledge. When someone has very clear, decisive, certain knowledge about bad and ugly nature of sins, that person becomes immune, as we are already immune with respect to certain things. For example, we don't go to the street nakedly. We don't drink blood. Because we understand, we feel the ugliness of these things. They are unpleasant to us. So for Ma'asumin, all the scenes are like that. So you are right. This has close connection with Taqwa. And it has even connection with Isma, depending on different levels of awareness and knowledge that one may have. Question number five. Divine judgment according to one's capacity. In lecture six, it was said that we will not be judged like the prophets and the imams would be judged. But Allah does not accept from expect from us the same as he expects from them. If I understood, does this mean that they have been given a boost or a capacity that we have not been given? If yes, what does that say about free will and predestination? Is it true that different human beings have different capacities and their ability to journey towards God? What is the wisdom of creating human beings with different capacities? This is actually part of the wise plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has distributed different amounts and levels of knowledge talents, memory, power, beauty, and things like that. نَحْنُ قَسَمْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ مَعِيشَتَهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَرَفَعْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ فَوْقَ بَعْضٍ دَرَجَاتٍ If we were all the same, if we were all equal, then the world would not be a world in which there were maximum potentials for tests and trials and therefore without having maximum opportunities for trials and tests we were not able to have maximum upgrades. If you are in a school that only offers primary exams then you cannot go to secondary level. You cannot go to higher education. 
So whenever the tests increase and become more sophisticated, although it means that the tests are becoming more difficult, but it is also a good sign that there is opportunity for you to go higher and higher. In addition to this, Inshallah, we will explain when we are in Aqaa talking about the problem of evil that also this world, this natural world, is the world of interactions, is the world of cause and effect. Many, many factors can have impact on a child from the time it's conceived, it's an embryo, it's delivered, it's growing. So mother, father's condition, environment, society, war, peace, poverty, famine, all these things can have impact on us. So we are not mass produced products of a factory. We are not the same in all the details. Yes, we are the same in essence. But in addition to the common essence, common nature that we have all as human beings, even two children of the same family are not exactly the same. They are not identical. Even twins are not identical from a philosophical point of view. <coughs> Therefore, Many different conditions can come. What is important is that <coughs> unless a person has ability for being a good person, he is not morally responsible. So if someone is put in a condition that he has no free will or no power or no rational capacity, so he's not morally responsible. But the majority of people, great percentage of people, are those who have these requirements for moral responsibility. The thing is that they are just different. Some are better. Some have easier conditions. Some have difficult conditions. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in His just evaluation of us he would not expect us to be the same he would expect us to utilize what we have been given in a proper way so it's not important how many good things someone has done you cannot understand and measure goodness of people depending on the good work they have done. For example, how many books this alim has written? How many masjids this mu'min has built? How many people he has fed? It's not a matter of quantity. Yes, quantity is important. But what is important for our moral evaluation is how much efforts have been put here laysa lil insan illa ma sa'a maybe a person has fed 100 people but he has not made any efforts just he picked up a phone or you know wrote a check and even it's not one percent of his, you know, saving. And another person has fed only one person. But even for feeding one person, he had to save every day a little money, a few cents, so that he can feed one person. Maybe a person has very good memory. He can memorize one page of the Quran in five minutes. Another person has bad memory. Even memorizing one line of Quran takes him a few hours. So you cannot judge people according to their performance. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects people to be doing well in their own context. Doing well with what they have been given. And when they do good, even if it is little, he acknowledges and he appreciates and he even thanks. As the Quran says that Allah is shakur, is very grateful. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Moving on to the next question. Uh, perpetual punishment and the mercy of God. This is related to the chapter about our future. How does perpetual punishment conform with the justice of God? How does perpetual punishment conform with the mercy of God? If the staunch disbeliever is terminate, terminated, would that not conform better with the mercy of God than for them to be eternally chastised in hell? Yes. Uh, again, this is a question for Aqaid, but uh, briefly, I would like to mention maybe one or two points. One is that the relation between punishment and reward on the one side, one hand, and action on the other hand is not a relation of arbitrary decision or choice or a contract made by a group of people or by for example I don't know a country or a parliament you know sometimes in some countries something is taken as permissible in some countries the same thing is taken as offensive is illegal because depending on the way they understand or they like to live they can have different laws or even those things which are taken as a, for example offense sometimes in some countries they have severe punishment in some countries they have you know not severe punishment so in the worldly system of reward and punishment uh, the Im amount the intensity, the duration can vary a lot, but on the day of judgment, the reward and punishment are manifestation of the same thing that we have done. A person would be judged to go to hell permanently which are not of course many people there are not many many categories of people who go to hell permanently as Amirul Mu'min says لكنك تقدست أسماءك أقسمت أن تملأها من الكافرين من الجنة والناس أجمعين وأن تخلد فيها المعاندين. so this is something for very um, narrowly defined categories. the people who have shown and demonstrated again and again. Their opposition to the truth, their ill-natured character. So, first of all, it's not that it's something that happens to many, many groups of people. But even for these people, this is the manifestation of their own nature. It's not something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided arbitrarily. Actually, on the Day of Judgment, if any rational person is put in a position to judge, 
he would make the same judgment. Even the criminals, when they see all the facts and they hear to all the witnesses about what they have done, they themselves would be enough to judge. كَفَى بِنَفْسِكَ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْكَ حَسِيبًا we don't need to bring any other person. We don't need to bring any judge or judiciary. The criminals themselves would say, this is what I deserve. The role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just to bring mercy to this calculation. Allah doesn't bring anger to this calculation. We see the result of our actions plus Rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the role of Allah is not to add to the punishment. The punishment is measured by just calculation and every person can make the same calculation if he has the same knowledge and the same justice. The only thing that Allah does is that he may reduce the punishment or he may forgive because of his mercy. So, recently we had a course on resurrection in Qom and I mentioned that on the day of judgment it's not that for some people Allah brings anger to justice and for some people He brings mercy to justice. No. It is either justice only or justice and mercy. There is no way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would make situation of someone worse than what it is. Inshallah, we'll talk about this more, inshallah, in Aqaid. So, we can move to the next question. Brother Jihad, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I was reading on mute. My apologies. So, um, uh, the question number seven, the heavens and the earth and the mountains and us, indeed we presented the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, but they refused to undertake it and, and were apprehensive of it, but man undertook it, and he is most unjust and ignorant. We mentioned that one of the defining characteristics of the human being is their potential to be God's vicegerent on earth. Based on the verse above, it is, correct, is it correct to infer that the heavens, the earth, and the mountains could also potentially be custodians of God's trust. Whether, yet, whether the answer is yes or no, what then would we learn from this verse about the relationship between us and the heavens, the earth, and the mountains? Should they be viewed simply as raw materials that we use to build material constructions, or are they more? They were not in a position to undertake this trust. So if by having potential, it is meant that they would possibly become the vicegerent of God and carry this trust? No. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا أَرَضْنَا الْأَمَانَةَ عَلَى الثَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَالْجِبَالِ فَأَبَيْنَ أَنْ يَحْمِلْنَهَا وَأَشْفَقْنَ مِنْهَا this abayna, this refusal or hesitance is natural. It's not that they wanted to disobey or they were lazy, they were you know, irresponsible. No, it means that it was beyond their capacity. So it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us they were asked and their honest answer was we are not able to do it. Human beings had the capacity and they accepted but unfortunately when they accepted and undertake, undertook this responsibility some of them didn't do justice. 
innahu kana zaluman jahula so skies earth mountains they had no capacity and they honestly said we are not able to do it because they never you know disobey or cheat human beings had the capacity and accepted and the problem is not why they accepted the problem is that when they accepted they didn't do justice so with respect to the end of the question whether heavens earth and mountains are simply raw materials you can look at them in this way and say allah has made them manageable to us so that we can use sakhara lakum ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard but we shouldn't underestimate them even raw material should not be underestimated even water soil sands nothing should be underestimated these are all signs of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are all sacred because these are the works of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if your father or mother that you love a lot has made a painting you would be expecting everyone to treat that painting with respect this is my father's painting if your father has built a house with his hand you would not even want to sell that house you want to keep it always and it will be heartbreaking to see that ha- uh, house is destroyed and if someone has a life for example your f- father has planted a tree a garden or if it is your brother and sister from your father so it all increases so for a mu'min everything in this world is a manifestation of god is a creation of god is a sign of god everything is sacred therefore we should not underestimate any creation or any creature question number 8 relation between self knowledge and uh, self purification as get in us yes assalamu alaikum alaikum assalam what is the relation between self knowledge and self purification is one require is one a requirement or a step to achieve the other is self knowledge a requirement or step in the process of self purification can we achieve self purification without self knowledge for example one way to achieve self purification is to give zakat a person may give zakat because he knows giving zakat is good The same person may not have much self knowledge and may have zero self knowledge altogether. So in this case is self knowledge important for self purification to make a contrast we also know or at least I think that self purification involves stopping any bad qualities forbidden things. So does this mean that we must first achieve some level of self knowledge before we are able to perform self purification thank you inshallah when we study self development one chapter is called breakdown of self development and there inshallah we'll explain the first step is self awareness or awakeness or yaqdha or in farsi we say bidari yaqdha so without some level of self knowledge it's impossible to do anything good even to give zakat with pure intention is impossible without some level of self knowledge some level of awareness if someone is in the condition of heedlessness ghafla he would not give zakat with pure intention either he doesn't give zakat at all even if he gives he may not have pure intention so 
the very very first step or station is awakeness and then after that is self-knowledge and then it comes self-care inshallah we will explain this in self-development thank you for the good question and inshallah keep it in your mind for when we study self-development question number nine god's lack of need for worship by his creatures assalamu alaikum maulana alaikum assalam you have mentioned that god does not lose anything from the lack of worship of some people god is not in need for their worship anyway my question is that some may argue that if god is not in need of their worship then then why will they be punished or why is there the existence of hell fire if god is not in need of their worship what would be the best answer to that thank you yeah those who are punished is not punished they are not punished because they have harmed god they are punished because they have harmed themselves and other people so no one is punished because he has harmed god no one can harm god if all people of the world disobey god they cannot harm god to the least so this is why we say that the sinners have done zulm to themselves. Rabbana innana valamna anfusana fa innaka illam taqfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al khasirin. Our Lord, we have done injustice to ourselves. And if you don't forgive us and don't show and have mercy on us, we will certainly be among the losers. So we do zone to ourselves, we do zone to other people, we do zone to other creatures, and this is the reason for punishment. So question number 10. Uh, follow up, this is a follow up to uh, the heavens, the earth, the mountains, and us. Follow up to that question. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum I'm just reading the question as is, and I don't mind saying salam, and you respond, inshallah. Uh, yani we can be like those in paradise who always say salam all the time. Uh, in, in lecture four, you mentioned that humans have been given intellect and desires, whereas the angels only have intellect and animals only have desires. In this ayah, which is the one about the mountains and the heavens, it states that the heavens, the earth, and the mountains refused to bear their trust and were apprehensive of it. Should this statement be taken as a literal act done by the heavens, earth, or mountains? If so, does, that, does this imply that they also possess some level of intellect, consciousness, free will, in which they were able to review, refuse to bear this trust? Uh, I think I already answered to this question when I said everything has two faces. The face, the watch, which is geared towards dunya, towards us, can be living or non-living, intelligent or unintelligent. But from the side, they face God, the Almighty, in their Malakuti aspect, they all are intelligent. So, if you want to look at the mountains and the skies and the earth from a worldly perspective then this would be not literal but if we look at them from a Malakuti perspective then it would be literal like when we say en men illa there is nothing except that it glorifies God and praises God so maybe we think it is symbolic but if it was symbolic why God says you don't understand their tasbih so it shows that it's a reality if you want to take it in a worldly perspective you say it's symbolic but the fact is that for God this is not symbolic this is 
said in a literal sense. Question number 11 uh, about the spirit. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Shamali. Alaikum wa alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Lecture 3, you mentioned the following. Even, uh, even sometimes the age of your body and your soul are not the same. For example, Nabi Isa alayhi salam spoke so magnificently from the cradle as a baby. Sometimes someone is 70 or 60 or 70 years old and they still act like a child. The mu'min may get old but the spirit doesn't. Please clarify this first statement whereby your body and your soul are not the same age. When humanity first bore witness to Allah's existence and unity, were we in a spiritual state or another form? We are also told that the soul enters the body at the third or fourth month of gestation. If we were in a spiritual state when we bore witness to Allah's unity, and if the soul is created first and then united with its physical body, a container slash body, then the two would not be of the same age. What happens to the soul when it is within the body that it can be considered to be old or young? Yes, this is an idea that I first mentioned in a conference in Com with some Christian philosophers and theologians from Austria, from University of Innsbruck. So I have not seen this myself expressly mentioned in um, sources, but I think would be agreeable when it is expressed. So, my idea is this, that we have two elements in every human being, body and the soul or a spirit. Here we use soul and spirit in the same way. Sometimes soul can be used in different sense, but we, here we mean rational soul, which is spirit. So, our body has an age. And normally we count from the date of birth, but actually it's not date of birth. Our body is born before birth. So when the fertilization takes place, then the embryo is taking form and our body is taking form before birth. But we normally consider the date of birth as the beginning. Then we say this person is 5 years old, 10 years old, 20 years old, 100 years old. So all people go through the same line. And then we compare people. We say this person is 30 years old, that person is 40 years old, so the one who is 30 years old is younger than the one who is 40 years old. But what about a spirit? Does a spirit go through the same aging system? No. Sometimes a person who is younger in the physical age can be more mature than a person who is older in the physical age for example a girl who is 12 maybe is more mature than a boy who is 15 a girl in the age of 9 becomes baller so if a girl is 12 a girl is more mature than a boy who is 12 or 13 or 14 even 15 or even you know maybe sometimes two boys two girls compared to each other, one of them, despite being in the same age, can be more mature. So, maturity of the spirit is something that normally comes with a certain age growth. For example, we say, you know, when someone is 15 years old, bo uh, is mature, a boy in 15, after 15 years is mature, but then, for example, legally, after 18 years old, this is based on average. 
but some people may be as mature as a person who is 15 when they are younger or they can be understanding everything like an 18 years old person even if for example this person is younger so the development of the spirit as average comes with some growth in the body but they are not always the same so some people they so fast develop that even when they are a child they can have very very good understanding like Isa alayhi salam like Imam Jawad alayhi salam Imam Jawad when he was nine years old became Imam Jesus in the cradle says Anni Abdullah atani al kitab wa ja'alani nabiya if you are limited to the age of body you would be surprised you would be shocked but if you know that spirit has its own line of progress then you would be able to understand that someone can be young in body but mature in soul and then when it comes to the soul soul is not subject to the aging problems of body you know whether you are mu'min or not mu'min your body when you become old becomes weaker even a great alim very pious when he becomes 90 100 110 120 you cannot think that he's a young person in his body maybe they become you know weaker later than other people maybe they can have longer life but body is changing body is becoming zaif like weak but what about the spirit a spirit doesn't need to become old a person can be 100 years old but have very energetic any a very young spirit and i think this is one reason why we say mu'minin in heaven are all young so even old people when they die and they are going to go to heaven they are young so this is not because their soul becomes young i think their soul is already young but in dunya body doesn't follow the soul in akhira body follows the soul so a young soul can keep the body young in dunya it can to some extent keep the body young but not completely because of the rules of the physics to which our body is subject okay
but call it in his own spirit. Number three, is it correct to say that even animal's soul is proportioned, like in Surah Al-Shams Sawaha, as to being able to differentiate right from wrong to some limited extent? What is the fitra? Uh, what is the fitra compared to the soul? Is the fitra defined by the way the soul is proportioned? Surah Al-Nahl, referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspiring the bee to build houses and mountains, which is the bee's fitra. And the last part, for animals have some moral character. For example, dogs are extremely loyal, assuming this is a characteristic of their fitra. Is it the same for human beings that our moral characteristics, generosity, bravery, are part of the fitra just like other animals? And that is our souls that have divine capacity to reach higher realms of spirituality. Basically, I'm wondering what is the characteristics of the fitra versus the soul? Thanks. Inshallah, when you study Islamic belief system, so when we talk about argument of fitra, I have a lengthy discussion there about the difference between animals and human beings, the difference between fitra and instincts. Animals have some understanding, but aql is not just to understand. Aql is the ability to understand universal concepts in its theoretical form. And the ability to discern between what is right and what is wrong in its practical sense. We have aql nadari, we have aql amali. Animals have soul, but animal soul is different from human soul. We have three types of souls. We have vegetative soul and nafsul nabatiya. We have animal soul and nafsul haywaniya. And we have an nafsul natiqa or aqila, rational soul. I have a paper uh, about uh, the psychic soul and this also paper was uh, presented in a conference in Austria. I think it's online. If it's not online, I will send it to the admin and they can share this paper with other people, inshallah. So, there is nafs for them, but their nafs is a lower level of nafs, like a person who is in the vegetative state. If a person, for example, has brain death, is a vegetative state, so there is nafs, but it's not functioning at the level of rational or intelligent nafs. And also, with respect to moral characteristics of animals, in the series on Akhlaq, in Hose, we have explained this, that we sometimes for, you know, getting inspirations, for uh, making things understandable, sometimes we refer to some qualities of animals. For example, we say dogs are loyal. Or for example, you know, we say that... Uh, some animals are, for example, I don't know, maybe very modest. But this is only a kind of anthropomorphism. Otherwise, it's not that they have understanding of loyalty. It's not that dog has a choice between being loyal and not being loyal and then chooses to be loyal. Even with respect to instincts, uh, for example, a mother cat, a mother cow has care for her child. But this is out of instinct, is different from a human mother who cares for her child. A mother acts out of choice. And there are rare cases that some human mothers may ignore their children. But an animal acts out of instinct. There is no exception in what they do. Therefore, they are not morally praised or blamed, and human beings are. Inshallah, we will have gradually these discussions uh, in Aqaid and Akhlaq. Thank you very much for the question.
The next quiz. Question number 13. About the world inside us. Mawlana, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. You mentioned in the first lecture about the internal world or the world within ourselves to be greater than the outside world. And that's the one we should focus on. At what point does this world become a reality to the human being? And how much of it is inherited through the good deeds and bad deeds of your parents and through the circumstances of your birth? For everyone, there is that great world. But what beautiful elements you have added to that great world or what ugly elements one has added can be different. Maybe because of upbringing, because of society, because of one's personal choice, some people's world, internal world is greater, is more magnificent, is more beautiful. But what is important is that in every human being there is such a great internal world. And this is the reason or one of the reasons why human beings are given the potential and the capacity of becoming Khalifatullah because every human being has that great world through his spirit some people ignore it some people discover it pay attention to it and cultivate it and the last question do we have an equal chance to be equally close to God despite having different mental, physical, spiritual capacities? In other words, are our efforts the only factor that decides how close we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately, even if the actions themselves and their effects vary drastically in quality and quantity between one person and another? Or are our efforts taken into consideration along with other factors such as the quality and quantity of our actions as I said the main thing is one's efforts لَيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى or أَنَّ السَّعْيَهُ سَوْفَ يُرَى you would see your efforts. Of course, if someone makes more efforts, so he tries to have more good actions. So quantity becomes a sign, a result. But quantity is not the measure. The measure is one's commitment, one's struggle, one's efforts. That a struggle that efforts is the main thing so this is also something that everyone can do everyone can have this struggle we cannot judge by appearance who is closer to God even people sometimes themselves may not know how close they are to God they may think that they are very bad people they are sinful people there is no way that God loves them but actually they may be very close to God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hadith al-Quds he says aninul muznabin ahabbu ilayya min tasbih al-musabbihin a sinful person who cries and laments over his sins his cry is more lovable to Allah than tasbih of a person who glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I am not saying that this person is closer to Allah than musabbih but I am saying that his cry is more lovable to Allah than, than tasbih of musabbih so what is important 
is sincere efforts constant struggle especially at the beginning this may not come necessarily with feelings with good feelings with beautiful moments of connection at the beginning you may not be given the sweetness of love the sweetness of connection but this is just to add to your thirst and to test your honesty if you keep knocking the door finally the door will be opened if you keep moving forward finally you will arrive at your destination so this is why we should not give up as I said last week there must be a stiqam. we should be persistent may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us always on the right path and give us the courage and determination which is very important to be inshallah always moving towards him not turning away even for a moment from his beautiful face from his watch at the end I just want to ask for a quick inshallah answer maybe within next five minutes ten minutes you can send this answer because the question is not too difficult what is the verse in the Quran which explains the relation between knowing ourselves and knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a reverse order compared to man arafa nafsa faqad arafa rabba hadith says knowing yourself leads to knowing your lord we said there is a verse in the quran that speaks about the same thing from the opposite direction so this is the question a test and i would like to receive uh, through the admin your answer in the next five maximum ten minutes inshallah Brother Jihad? Uh, I asked uh, people to type it in the chat, but um, if you guys want to just uh, unmute the answer, go ahead. Maybe if we give chance everyone to write, because if one says, then other people don't have chance to write. So if everyone can send in writing their answer to you. Okay? Yes, yes, agree. Okay. So we have, we have a chat that we could all see. We have a chat that we're all able to see, right? Under the participant section. Yes. So you guys can utilize that. Just type it right in there. That would give away the answer, no? You know, I mean, I mean uh, first one, first serve in this case, right? Okay. Where is it? So the chat is right under, uh, right under, you know, when you see the participants, you see the Maulana uh, in there, and then there's a tab, it's called chat. Oh, so yeah. Okay, So, 
Uh, everyone sees the answer for from other people or no? Yes, yes, everyone does see each other, the other person's answer. We have a few answers that are, that are coming in. And I'm going to add another one myself. But it's not the one you put in the book. <laughs> I think uh, we should have a system to let everyone to give his answer or her answer uh, without seeing the answer from other people so that uh, they would still have time to give the answer. Uh, but for, for this week, I think uh, now because the time is over and also people have already given answer, so... The ayah that I asked about is, as you rightly mentioned, verse 19 of chapter 59. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنْفُسَهُمْ Allah Taba Tabai Rahmatullah Alai says this is aks aks naqiz for man arafa nafsa faqad arafa rabba. In logic, we say if P then Q then not Q leads to not P. So if ma'rifatun nafs leads to ma'rifatun rab, then having no ma'rifah of rab leads to having no ma'rifatun nafs. So there is a close connection. Those who have ma'rifah of nafs, they have ma'rifah of rab. Those who have ma'rifah of rab have ma'rifah of nafs. If someone lacks one, lacks the other. But the way the order is suggested here is that the key is ma'rifatun nafs and the result is ma'rifatun rab. Thank you for the good answers that you have given. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the ability to have both Ma'rifatul Nafs and Ma'rifatul Rabb, insha'Allah, and please remember us in your du'as. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam. Thank you so much, Mawlana. May Allah give you strength. Thank you. Inshallah, until next time, we will we will meet again. Inshallah. Al-Tamasada. Fi amanillah. Fi amanillah.